So nobody likes my hat. <laughs> I saw you were catching a lot of heat about that on Facebook last night. My wife came home and she said, have you seen what they're saying about your hat? And I said, no, because frankly, I don't care. But I hadn't been on the Facebook page because I have work to do. Uh, but she pulled it up on. She said, "Oh, it's they're they're it's pretty it bad." Funny. Yeah, and it's so great. we pulled it up, and the two of us sat in the kitchen, and uh, and just laughed at some of the comments. Apparently, I'm I'm a hipster yeah, trying uh, to attract the hipster audience. I'm, yeah, That's I'm gonna I'm gonna be Pinky Blinders, you know. It's <laughs> the next season of Pinky Blinders. Um, look, man, I that's I like that kind of I put that that hat I actually wore yesterday because I didn't comb my hair that morning. I got up, I had been busy writing sales copy so that I could make some money. And I took a look at my watch. I was behind schedule, so I just threw the hat on as I went out the door. And I knew when I sat down behind the desk that I was going to get heat for it. Mm. But here's the thing. All y'all who are giving me heat Sitting at your computer desk, sporting a pair of khaki shorts and a replica vintage Def Leppard t-shirt you bought at Old Navy. Um, don't try and give me uh, advice on, uh, on fashion, all right? Those of you who think dressing up is a pair of blue jeans, your favorite Lakers sports jersey, and a pair of flip-flops, that's not style. So don't talk to me about what's stylish and what looks good and what doesn't because all of you wish you wish you could pull off that hat you really do but you can't and so you don't even try and you resort to just attacking me attacking my style and i will not be attacked it, it bounces off of me so anyway <laughs> that's all i got to say about that but i did think it was funny you guys are very creative you have a lot of time taking a lot hands. of heat about the hat and a lot of heat about the goatee and the mustache oh i know yeah it's uh I, i'm dude i even got i even got heat about uh, about the bracelets that i wear it's, it's it's everything 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 they can poke at boop boop it's okay it doesn't water water off oh it doesn't matter water off the duck uh, off a duck's back it doesn't uh doesn't prevent me from pursuing my ends at all. And, uh, and you know, and, and plus I enjoy seeing all of your humorous comments about, uh, about the way I dress and the way I look. It's funny. And uh, welcome back, everybody. This is the Jason Stapleton Program broadcasting live once again from the Random Walk Studios deep in the heart of America. And, uh, and today I have a, a very special guest for you. I had Tom Woods on, did an interview with Tom. Oh, uh, I think I did it, did it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and, uh, and shortly, right before I, I was set to do that interview, I got a, uh, a, someone from the Libertarian Party reached out to me and said, hey, would you be interested in having Nick Sarwark on your show to talk about the controversy? And I said, well, um, I don't know. I said, Tom Woods' interview is going to be released soon. And I said, why don't you guys listen to that interview? And if he's still interested in coming on, then I will make, I will make room for him uh, to come in and, and kind of tell his side of it. And uh, because as, as you guys know, I was, I was pretty, I was, I was, uh, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not an independent third party. Uh, I have an opinion. And, uh, and after it aired, Nick, people reached out and so he is here today nick thank you so very much for coming on to the show i appreciate you being here thank you for having me jason all right so let's talk a little bit about this so first thing th th there's been some controversy recently between some of about some of the things you have said about both mises institute jeff uh, i believe, I believe his last name is deist and and tom woods and uh, it all started from what i can gather uh from a petition on some third-rate website nobody's ever heard about, uh, asking those in the libertarian movement to sign their name to a petition uh, against Nazism, against white supremacy, against fascism, or, or some other uh, such nonsense. And there were a handful of people who didn't sign it. And then the tweets started rolling out from, from you. And so they were going directly to, I guess, uh, Mises Institute and then towards Tom Woods. And so I guess I will open up the conversation by asking you, why are you picking fights with good people? Uh, you know, it was a fight that needed to be picked. Uh, it actually goes back way before that petition. Um, Jeff Deist had done a speech at Mises in which he used the line blood and soil, um, which was most famously used by the Nazis. And he got called out on it by some people um, who may have been identified from the left. 
but it, it's not words that you want to be using in modern American politics. And instead of saying, hey, my bad, I didn't know that it had those connotations, this is not good, I apologize, anything like that, Woods and Deist and Murphy and everybody at Mises basically circled the wagons and said, well, it doesn't even mean anything. Then about a week to well, later, hang on. let me let me just let me address that sure. first, because I, I did read the I did read the speech that Deist wrote. Uh, I'm not sure if he spoke it or not, but he did write it. And I read the I read the transcript of it. And the ref what you're referencing is at the very, very end of the article. And what he says is things like blood and soil. And uh, he mentioned one other thing do still matter to people. And I, it, it, it appeared as though, I don't know whether there's a poor choice of words or not, and I don't know Jeff Deese, and I have no idea. The guy could be an incredible racist. I don't have any idea. But what I do know is, is that that reference was not designed specifically in the context of what he was talking about to refer to anything other than nationalism. Um, and that was, we, we can call it a poor choice of words if you want to, but to claim that that was an, a, a somehow a... Uh, a drop to white supremacists and, and and white power advocates is is really a stretch. Well, I mean, what you're saying right there is that you don't know what's in Jeff Deese's heart, and nobody does other than Jeff Deese. But then you're also saying that you do know that it was totally not a dog whistle. So, I mean, those two positions are not consistent with each other. No, what I'm telling you is uh, this is what I'm saying is I'm saying when I read it. The, what he what he was intending to infer as I read that section of the piece, which was right, it's like in the last sentence of of a of a large speech, was not intended to uh, to advocate for white supremacy. Now Je that doesn't mean that he isn't a white supremacist. What I'm telling you is I don't know whether he is or not, but I'm telling you that piece of it did not read like that. It was intended to try and recruit uh, white power to the libertarian movement. I've listened to the speech. I read the speech. Um, I have my own critiques of the speech. That line is bad. Um, it's kind of like, you know, work might make you free, but using that phrase is probably going to set off some warning bells with some people. Here's what happened, though. You have the, the wagon circling, right? And, and let's stipulate for a moment that it's a completely innocent use of the phrase. It's not intended as a dog whistle. Nobody wants it to be a dog whistle. Then you get the Tiki Torch Taliban marching through Charlottesville, chanting, blood and soil, blood and soil, Jews will not replace us. So now you've got actual white nationalists and white supremacists chanting the same phrase that Jeff Deist used in his speech, innocently or not. That is the context that led to a group of libertarians, I don't actually even know who created the petition, saying, look, there's left, there's right, there's centrist, there's all kinds of libertarians out in the movement. But the one thing that all of us agree on is that white supremacists and fascists are not part of the libertarian movement. They're not libertarians. And we just want to reiterate that because we have these things happening in society, in the news. And it's in that context that Tom Woods makes a, a defense, well, I shouldn't have to sign any petition. I, I, my whole life's work is against fascism. And, you know, why, why would I sign a petition? Well, part of the reason is your institute, your program, your fans include some people who were the sort of people who were marching in Charlottesville. No, no, that, no, no. That, that, that's, that's an absolutely ridiculous argument. That, that means that if I have some people who listen to my show who happen to be white supremacists, that I somehow now have to defend myself against the accusation that because they listen, I am a white supremacist. I mean, I didn't sign the petition either, mainly because it doesn't matter because I don't have to answer to anybody for my opinions. I let my voice on this show speak for me. So am I a white supremacist because I no doubt have those people listening to my show because I support the Mises Institute as well? I don't think you're a white supremacist. I don't think Tom Woods is a white supremacist. I don't think Jeff Deist is a white supremacist or Bob Murphy. I've never said that I think that they're racist or white nationalists or white supremacists or anything like that. But That's you're asking them to Tom defend. Woods made up. 
because he wants to play the victim card. No, no, no. You're asking him to defend himself and disprove a negative, which is r utterly ridiculous. This is the problem that I have with it, is you're saying, well, since you work for the Mises Institute and somebody might have said something that could have come off as a dog whistle copy for, for white supremacists, you now have to prove that you're not one by signing this petition that somebody we don't even know created. He doesn't have to prove anything. Well, yeah, but he most certainly does by you and by the tweets that you tweeted out. I don't think I don't think he has to say anything he doesn't want to say. But what he doesn't get to do is loudly say, I will not say this thing while condemning leftists, condemning communism, condemning everything in the world except for this thing, and then not be have anybody take any inferences from it. You know, you have a right to free speech, and I have a right to say your free speech is saying something that's not good. You know, here's the thing. No, 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 no. Hang on. No, no, no. Again, again, you are you are absolutely missing the underlying point. He's not saying anything racist. He's not saying anything neo-Nazi. Tom Tom Woods has never been a person who advocated those kinds of principles. And what Agreed. you are saying is by his inaction, by his unwillingness to denounce specifically the way you want him to denounce it, he is in he is somehow inferring or outright stating that he supports that action, which in clearly he does not. Okay. So you that's agree with me you, then? No, that's how you interpret it. That's that's the way it's, that's the only way to interpret it. This is the frustration I have is I don't see any other way to interpret what you're saying. Let, let, me, let me lay out some facts for you and you can decide what you want to do with them. Tom Woods had Chris Cantwell on in 2014 and said he agreed with a lot of his ideas and they were things that he wasn't able to say. Correct. Tom Woods had Paul Gottfried on uh, the day after Charlottesville. Paul Gottfried was the mentor for Richard Spencer. And Paul Gottfried's biggest problem with Richard Spencer in setting up the alt-right was that Spencer used clear language instead of, you know, sort of couching some of these terms in language that wouldn't set off the normals. Tom Woods had Lou Rockwell on just the other day to talk about how terrible it was that Google decided to disassociate from the Daily Stormer. This is, a, this is the issue. Bob Murphy accurately quoted me. Late stage Rothbard paleoconservatism was not about being racist. It's not about being racist. It is about pandering to and marketing to racists. That's the issue. It's not that I'm saying that Tom Woods is a Nazi or a white supremacist. What I'm saying is that when you don't say something in the context of what happened in Charlottesville, like the president didn't say something in the context or talked about how they were very fine people, people hear that. Richard Spencer tweets out after Trump gives his, his statement post Charlottesville and says, you notice he didn't denounce the alt-right, we're still okay. Silence means something. And, you know, you can take an inference from it or you cannot take an inference from it. You can listen to Tom Wood's defense and decide that that's persuasive to you. But part of the thing is, if we're libertarians, if we don't believe that government force should be used to suppress any kind of view, should be used to suppress any kind of free speech, then it is incumbent upon us to speak out uh, about views that are repugnant. Well, I, I, I accept that. As as a, as a uh, as as something that we should all be doing, what I what I reject entirely is the fact that because Tom Woods had Chris Cantwell on his show in 2014 and said that he agreed with many of the fights that he was picking in the libertarian movement, uh, and he appreciated the fact that Cantwell was doing it so that he didn't have to. I mean, this was before Cantwell went rogue and decided that he was going to become a white supremacist. I mean, uh, Dave Smith had Cantwell on his show the day after the, 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 the fights broke out in Charlottesville. Dave is a Jew. Is Dave a neo-Nazi who's supporting that because he had Cantwell on his show? Absolutely not. And that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that this is a marketing strategy, right? This is the right wing populism paper that Rothbard wrote way back in the 80s. Rothbard was a Jew. I, so <laughs> I'm, I'm talking. Wait a second. What what are you? trying to go into identity politics here no no I'm what i'm saying is you're, you're trying to what I'm you're trying to what say is no what you're trying to say is is that current a lot of current libertarian thought and rothbardian thinking panders to neo-nazis 
And no. I'm saying that that is absolutely and that if if you don't denounce it, that you're part of the problem. So you're creating something, you're, you're making a statement that is, in my opinion, not based in fact. And then you're pointing out people like Tom Woods um, and, uh, and and Bob Murphy, and you're saying, well, these guys won't denounce it, so that means they must be part of the problem. And, and, and I just think that that is utterly ridiculous, especially given the current state of the Libertarian Party. It seems you would have more valuable uses of your time. Hey, do you own uh, any real estate or are you thinking about maybe buying some rental property? Well, how do you know that the person that you're getting in there uh, to rent from you has good credit? You know, evicting a tenant can cost as much as $3,500 and take as long as four weeks. And one in five tenant applications has a relevant criminal hit. Well, right now, you can use something that I really love. It's called Smart Move, and you can find out what you don't know about your rental applicants and how you can save 25% off your next tenant screening. It is absolutely one of the most convenient ways uh, to search for a great tenant, 100% online and accessible from all devices. Sign up in a matter of minutes. There are great reports, credit reports, criminal background checks, and eviction records from TransUnion. Get information you cannot get on their Facebook page. Listen, if you own a rental property or you know someone who does, try Smart Move so you don't have to find out the hard way that a prospective tenant is an eviction risk. Go to tenantscreening.com, enter code Stapleton, and get twenty-five off your ne- twenty-five dollars off your. Oh, sorry, excuse me, twenty-five percent off your next screen. Don't be in the dark about your applicant's rental history. Know your tenants with Smart Move Tenant Check. Go to tenantscreening.com, enter my code Stapleton to get started with Smart Move. You'll get great reports, great confidence, and great tenants. Rothbard's strategy was about appealing to right wing populists. It was not about being a populist, it was about appealing to those people. It, it talked about look at all these things that David Duke is saying, we can appeal to them. That strategy is a marketing strategy. It attracts an audience who likes that sort of thing. If you read, there's an article from 2013 on American Renaissance, which is the journal of race realism in this country, talking about which libertarians do we like, we being the race realists. And it's Hoppe, it's Gottfried, it's Woods, it's a lot of the people from the Mises Institute. It's not Block because Block is for open immigration. but when you are popular with that segment of the market and you specifically go out of your way to say all sorts of controversial things that are not on the three by five card of acceptable opinion but the one thing you can't say is racists aren't welcome in the libertarian movement that says something i don't think it does and i think that you are wrong to state that tom doesn't doesn't make a case against fascism and against uh, Nazism, because that he spends. Uh, I, I listen to his show every day. I mean, the, the man is a the man is one of the leading voices in libertarianism today, and he's a good voice. And he's he's a he is an uh, really is a, as standards go an uncontroversial voice in terms of inside of the libertarian movement. He, he doesn't he doesn't take on crazy fights. He doesn't uh, he's not a Cantwell. Um, he's a stable voice for reason and and. And economic literacy but what you're saying is is that so for example my show my show panders to and I actually try and reach neoconservatives mainly because I used to be in the military and because I know how to talk to them and I've been able to bring many of them under the libertarian banner because of the way that I explain things but that doesn't mean that I'm a neoconservative just because I look at that audience and I say you know what I can I, I can reach that audience that's somebody I know how to talk to. That's somebody I can present a compelling case to. And therefore, I want to try and bring them in. You know, I, I, I don't understand the argument that says, well, if we look at neo-Nazis and we think, you know what, I, I think based on, their, on some of their belief systems that I can mold that and shift that and bring them into the Libertarian Party and change the way that they think about the world, I don't see how that's a, a negative thing. Okay, so now you, you've shifted the, the argument. The argument you're now making is that it's good to market to this audience because we can bring them along. And that may be a valid argument, and that may be what the strategy is. But just two minutes ago, you're telling me that that's not really what Tom's doing. So either he is marketing to that audience on purpose, and his tagline is, you know, this whole idea of being contrarian, 
and and going outside the bounds of acceptable opinion. So here's the thing. Sometimes your opinion is unacceptable because it's out of the mainstream and sometimes it's just not a good opinion. And this this defense isn't really a defense, right? If if you are popular with that market segment, it's because you're doing something to market to that market segment. That that may be uh, something that you can defend, but what Tom is doing is he won't defend marketing to that segment. He won't say I'm reaching out to the the white supremacist. I'm reaching out. And why do you out- think he's reaching out to white supremacists? I don't know. Why do you think? No, no, no. What, what, what? I mean, what, what do you have that supports that? I, I don't understand what I, I, I listen. Like I said, I listen to Tom's show all the time. I, I don't ever, I don't ever, I don't ever, I don't see it. I don't hear it. Okay, uh, and that may be something that you don't hear. I did just reference the the article from a journal of white supremacist thought saying Tom Woods is one of our favorite libertarians. Right, but right. how does that? But that that has absolutely nothing to do with what Tom has said. That just means that you've got some white supremacists that like him. Why do they like him? I, I don't have any idea. You tell me. Uh, part of the reason is because Tom Woods' libertarianism and the Mises Institute libertarianism follows a Hoppian line that says that we can exclude people who are not like us from our communities or from our our property, and they people who want to set up a white ethno state. Like it if your movement says, yep, that's totally okay and fits into libertarianism. Right. Well, I, I, I believe that you ought to be able to do whatever you want to with your business, even if that means excluding blacks and Jews and anybody else because it's your business. If suddenly a bunch of white, uh, white neo-Nazis start listening to my show and, and promoting me and saying he's one of our people, does that mean I suddenly have to disavow them and I have to I have to make claims that I don't follow that ideology or that I don't care about them or can I just continue on um, promoting the principles that I believe in and say look it's uh, you know I can't help who follows me all I can do is let my words speak for me you you can do what you want I mean I believe in this idea of free speech I believe that you get to say what you want I don't believe in the idea of consequenceless speech you know I run a business too. Right, but here's the problem. He's not speaking to neo-Nazis. This is the thing. Your your argument is he's not disavowing them. So he's not he's not making any statements that are pro-neo-Nazi. He's simply choosing not to be forced into a corner to sign some petition that you guys say is necessary in order for him to prove himself. He's choosing not to offend part of his market. And these are the people that buy his, you know, subscribe to his podcast and and buy entry into his Facebook safe space and buy tickets for his floating safe space. You know, I get as a marketer. His floating safe space? Are you talking about his 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 uh, his uh, cruise that he and that that he and uh, uh, what's his name do? Bob Murphy do? Yes. I'm talking about the one where he says, you know, where you won't hear libertarian infighting. You know, he's a relentless marketer and he's good at it. But, you know, for a guy who likes to talk about how he's outside the bounds of, you know, acceptable opinion, he's very quick to dismiss people as either leftist or low IQ, to block them and to not respond to any arguments that are outside the bounds of his contrarian world. Mm -hmm. He has a market and he has an audience and his audience doesn't want him to say these things. So he doesn't. He actually has his own three by five card of acceptable opinion. It may be a mirror image of the three by five card that I don't know the New York Times has. That's that's his tagline. But he does go out of his way to not say things that would offend that segment of his market. And they are part of his market. They are part of his fans. Yeah, I just I don't know how you could possibly know that other than to read some uh, some uh, neo-Nazi rag that says they like him. The well, there's that. There's the comments on his blog. There's the comments on his YouTube channel. There's his I mean, Twitter. You, I, mean, I, I guess, but do you realize? I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what the Libertarian Party is doing, Nick. But I can tell you, I have a, I have a private group of about eight thousand people, and we let people. We do a screening process before anybody comes in, and it still takes a team, a team of people, to cull through that uh, that private facebook group every single week and get rid of people who are there just to cause problems 
And I, I don't, I mean, it's, I think it's unfair. I mean, frankly, it's just unfair for you to look at a guy who has a following and to carve out a portion of that following who say really terrible things and to, to make that, a, 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 I guess, an explanation or, or an example of what his entire movement and his entire message is about. I, I understand that you think that that's unfair. I had no problem saying very explicitly that racists and white nationalists are invited to leave the Libertarian Party. You have no problem in your private Facebook group setting out particular rules for what is and isn't acceptable behavior. So when the opportunity arises to say, look, what I'm talking about is not what those guys marching in Charlottesville are talking about. It's different. Those are people that I don't agree with. Those are people that I don't want to be my supporters or my fans. I'm not interested in that. This is an unacceptable opinion. He has the opportunity to say that. He's very quick to say it's unacceptable to be a leftist. He's very quick to say it's unacceptable to be a communist. He's very quick to say these things are unacceptable and there's a one thing that just won't come out of his mouth. He will not say it's unacceptable to be a racist. He will not say it's unacceptable to be a white nationalist. He won't say that because that would offend a portion of his audience. Now, maybe he won't say it because he's just, gosh darn it, stubborn and contrarian and he just won't sign things if people ask him to. That's fine and he can make that argument. And whether it's persuasive or not is up to the listener. It's not up to you and it's not up to me. Okay, time for an obscene profit break, as Rush Limbaugh would say it. We're going to talk to you a little bit about 5-4. Are you uh, looking for uh, for some new threads? Well, guys, looking good doesn't have to cost a fortune, and 5-4 Club is revolutionizing the way men shop. Each month, they send you a, a curated box of two to three items that are hand-picked to match the current season and your style. They've been helping men with fashion for over 15 years and shipping to over 100,000 men every month. They know what they're doing, so if you don't, that's okay. 5-4 Club will help you build your wardrobe one month at a time. And right now, you can go to 5-4Club.com and enter my promo code STAPLETON, and they'll give you 50% off your first month's package plus a free pair of sunglasses. That's 50% off your first package at 5-4 Club, spelled F-I-V-E. F-O-U-R club dot com promo code Stapleton. 54club.com promo code Stapleton. You guys should check it out. They're gonna give you a hundred and twenty dollars worth of clothes for just sixty bucks. And you can pause or cancel at any time. 54club.com promo code Stapleton. Okay. So let's shift gears then and let's talk a little bit about the Libertarian Party in general. What is what's your goal moving forward with the LP? Uh, because it was, I was, I was not impressed when I showed up at the convention uh, in, during the election year, and um, and I've been a li- uh, not very impressed with Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, and frankly, I don't really know after this last spat you've had online with some of the leaders uh, of of libertarian thought. I mean, shoot, if you combine the audiences of. Uh, of Woods and myself and, and Dave Smith, you pretty much got every libertarian who listens to podcasts. And and I guess my point, my question, I guess to ask it again is, what's your plan moving forward? What is your objective with the Libertarian Party prior in advance of, uh, of the 20, uh, 2018 election? Uh, our goal is to run over 2,000 candidates nationwide to continue to be the only political party in the country that's growing. Um, You know, of all the national political parties, we're the only one that's growing by voter registrations. We just exceeded half a million registered voters who are registered as libertarian in places that they can register partisan. We just hired a new press secretary. We're breaking previous fundraising records. Um, We got three times as many votes as we've ever had before for a presidential ticket. You know, we're in the midst of hiring another person to support candidates and campaigns around the country. So... My goal is nothing more or less than a world set free in our lifetime and becoming and displacing the two old political parties that don't speak to important issues like free trade, open immigration, ending the war on drugs, ending the wars overseas. Those are things that, you know, aren't being spoken to. They're real solutions to Americans' problems. And so we're just going to continue the phenomenal growth. 
One of the complaints coming out of uh, of local of, of states, uh, state libertarian uh, parties, is that they don't get any help from from the national uh, from the national libertarian party. Is it your intention in the in the coming months uh, into 2018 to be financially and and technically tactically supporting uh, the local candidates who are running? We've had actually a full time affiliate support person and a very active affiliate support committee for years now. Um, state parties that want assistance from the national party have someone who will actually go in and help them set up their IT systems, set up their website, learn to do fundraising, get to the point where they can hire an executive director. So I don't know which states are complaining, but if they haven't asked for any help, then it's hard to help them. If I don't know that they need help, I can't help them. But we've been doing that for years now. What about financial support? Are you going to be helping them out financially? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, running a campaign with some, it's tough to find people to run as libertarian candidates when there's no money and they don't really have an idea of how to raise money. And with you increasing your uh, your donations to the national party, is, is any of that going to flow down to the state and local elections? Uh, it primarily, the national party expends money on helping states do stuff that states can't do easily by themselves. For example, in Ohio, uh, the Kasich administration helped cheat to kick the Libertarian Party off of the ballot. And now we're investing um, close to a quarter million dollars in Ohio to give a Libertarian option back to the people of Ohio um, and show them that they, they can't keep us down even when they cheat. Um, we just funded a ballot access drive in Tennessee so that we'll have Libertarian Party ballot access for the first time in party history. In Tennessee, um, it's very easy to run as an independent but it takes over 30,000 valid signatures to be a political party. You know, the old parties will cheat with both hands to keep us down. And what the national party is focused on is making sure that that cheating doesn't win, that we show them that we're not going anywhere, we're not going to be pushed around, and, and we continue to grow and advance and succeed. Yeah, sure. Well, one of my, com one of my complaints, um, and this, uh, this doesn't have to do with you specifically, but just the Libertarian Party in general, is that they've been around for 40 years now, and we're still fighting ballot access issues. It seems to me that this should have been something that was solved two decades ago and that we should be on to uh, that the Libertarian Party should be in a position now where where they are, uh, uh, you know, where they're winning elections, winning, you know, mainstream elections. And I recognize the difficulty in that the two party system really has a stranglehold on the political process. But um, it's it frustrates me to see us continuing to work on things that you feel like should have been solved down the road uh, decades ago. And when I looked, when I was at the at the election, um, at, I'm sorry, at the at the national convention this last year, uh, and you know, naked guys jumping up on stage, and I know that stuff you don't really want to talk about, and it's it's frustrating. I saw that as a kind of a I don't know if you want to call it a a, a symptom of some of the underlying. Uh, problems that exist inside the Libertarian Party. And I don't know, is that something that you guys are trying to address to become a more professional party as you move forward? Or do you kind of like that granola, granola image of the Libertarian Party? Hey, do I look like I'm naked to you, Jason? No, no, no. I'm just saying we, that that, well, that happened. Naked, elected? No, no, no. I'm just saying it, it happened. It happened. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the Democrats had to have their, their chairwoman resign in disgrace for rigging their internal process and the republicans cut off the mic of a sitting u.s senator because they wanted to quash any kind of dissent to the coronation of donald trump yes yeah, so, so you didn't rush a nearly naked man off of stage you allowed him to continue his dance uh i didn't have the gavel because you aren't allowed to have the gavel during your own election okay okay <laughs> I'm the only person in the hall who was not in a position to be able to do something about it under Robert's rules. One of the things I want to clarify with you, maybe, is you say us and then you say they. You say us and they, us and they. Are you a Libertarian Party member? No. Okay. Um, so your complaints are that we are not doing the things that you want us to do. And you think that we are frustrated, but we are growing by leaps and bounds, we're the only political party that's actually growing in, in any kind of voter registration. So, I mean, we're succeeding and you're calling out these perceived problems. You know, I'm very professional, I'm articulate, 
we're getting more news coverage than we've ever gotten before. You know, a guy tried to get up on stage and make our process into a joke, and we escorted him out of the room. A guy got up on stage at the Republican convention to make their process into a joke, and they nominated him, and now he's the president of the country. So I think the Libertarian Party is doing just fine. Well, I, I wish I could agree with you. I mean, I would really like to join the Libertarian Party. It's one of the things I said to Tom when I was talking with him is that I, I really would like to. But every time I turn around, there's there's something else in the news that that runs afoul of, of what I want my name associated with. And so I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's wrong for me to to be critical of of uh of deficiencies I see inside of a party that I, I that I that carries my my name, you know, it carries the libertarian name, something that I I want to be associated with because I believe in the ideas. But it, it's been very difficult for me, um, especially after Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, to stand in front of the microphone and say, no, 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 I'm a I'm a libertarian. When their only really their only attachment to that was what they saw in Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, and and I understand. To to your point that you got more people to vote libertarian this year than you ever this last time this last round than you ever had um I, I hope that that carries forward i really do but but i think that that was really that was really the opportunity that the libertarian party had to make it to, to make a definitive difference and i, I worry about what it's going to look like the next election and, and i will be happy to have you back on to eat my words if uh, if things are dramatically different. But I'm, I'm deeply concerned about the state of the Libertarian Party right now. Uh, there's this concept in economics called revealed preference. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but, you know, people protest Walmart coming to their town and say it's going to kill mom and pop small businesses. But then you see them in the Walmart parking lot actually buying stuff at Walmart and supporting them with their dollars. You know, when you say that you're concerned about the direction of the Libertarian Party, that you want it to be better, you want it to be in a different uh, different place from where it's at, that you'd like to join, you know, that those are great words to say, but actions speak louder than words. You know, the party is made up of who shows up. It's made up of the people who were in the convention hall in Orlando. You know, we had record attendance for that national convention. It was the biggest national convention we ever had. Those are the people who chose to nominate the presidential and vice presidential nominees. We don't have a rigged system. I don't pick winners and losers inside the party. The party picks. You know, there are people who are not happy with me as chairman of the party. Most of them, uh, your audience, Tom Woods' audience, a lot of them are not members of the Libertarian Party because a lot of people within the broader Libertarian movement have pissed all over the Libertarian Party for, for decades and talked about how it's terrible and it shouldn't exist and it's a, a cul-de-sac and it's a failed strategy and they should just quit and join the Republicans. Well, now we're succeeding. And all the people who have been telling us that this is a, a waste of time are now coming out of the woodwork to tell us how we ought to run our party. Well, if you don't show up to run the party, I, I accept your criticisms, right? I do hostile media all the time with people from the right and the left and, and mainstream media and alternative media. And there are a lot of people who are critical of the Libertarian Party. But those criticisms are given all due respect. And when you're not a constituent, when you're not part of the party, when you're not willing to roll up your sleeves and actually do the work to move the party in the direction that you want it to go, then you're you're more than welcome to snipe from the sidelines. Well, it, I, the I, people I, doing the work are going to run the party. I take issue with the fact that you say I'm sniping from the sidelines because I run a show here every day speaking to anybody who will listen about the tenets of liberty and about the value of libertarianism. And my biggest problem is that you make what I do hard because of the way your party runs itself. And no, I don't want to attach my name to it and that doesn't make me wrong for not wanting to join and try and fix what's broken inside of the LP. Um, well, I could turn and say to you, why are you making my job so hard? Why are you making me show up and talk about libertarianism more difficult because one of the heads of your party says things like uh, the military are a bunch of uh, murderers? You know, it, it, this type of stuff is it makes what I do difficult. And what I am doing is not infighting with guys like Tom Woods and, Mur and and Bob Murphy. What I'm trying to do is actually reach out and draw new people in to the ideas that hopefully will lead them 
into a party that reflects the same values and ideas and principles of liberty that I promote on this show. So that's what's frustrating to me. It, you know, we have different jobs. You are a podcaster. You are a very successful podcaster. You're about building an audience for ideas. We are the one of only three national political parties and the only one that's growing. We work in the political marketplace. We run candidates. We get votes. We fight in court for ballot access. We fight in court for people's rights. We go out and give a voice to the voiceless and provide an actual political alternative in the political marketplace. It is very easy to choose not to engage in the political marketplace and then critique people who are actually in the fight. You have a different job and you're doing a good job of it. I have a different job from you, and I'm doing a good job of it. Here's what I would say, because I understand your point is valid. We are in different spaces. If I was in your space, I would be knocking the cover off the ball because that's what I do. I grew this show in two years to one of the largest libertarian podcasts on the planet, and nobody knew my name two years ago. And okay. that's what I do. So in very short periods of time, I'm able to build massive movements. And so I don't think it's unfair for me to criticize the Libertarian Party for, you know, hailing a 3% a 3% of vote 40 years after they first came uh, they first came to be. I think that that's a fair criticism to say, look, we should be further along with this and what's broken. I think I'm an authority on how to reach people, on on how to build a movement. And I, you know, it's you, you are free to dismiss me if you want, and you're free to criticize Tom Woods if you want. I just want you to know that you're cutting off your nose to spite your face, because we are the voices. We are the people who drive people to the Libertarian Party. That, that's what makes the change. There, there's absolutely no doubt about it. And I appreciate the work that you all do. And, and I recognize that, you know, there, there are limited things that you can do, Nick, as, as, as being the head of the LP. It's much bigger than you. You don't decide who gets nominated and all of that stuff. I'm just saying you're, my, my bigger problem is the fact that you are attacking the very voices that are driving people to you. I, I don't want to dismiss you, Jason. You, you've just said that you would be knocking the cover off the ball if you were in my position. So rather than dismiss you, I want to invite you. Come down to New Orleans, the June 30th through July 3rd. There's a national convention in 2018. My job is up for, for election. You can be the chair of the Libertarian Party. You would have to join first, of course. But you can go and knock the cover off the ball. You would be the chair going into the 2020 election. Look, you I can't, be, look, Nick, I can't do, do your that. job. That's Listen, you do. Nick, I can't do your job and my job. I know I can do my job, and I'm pretty darn confident that if I was in your shoes, I could do your job. But I can't do both jobs. I got this on top of all the other stuff that I'm doing, too. What I want is for the Libertarian Party, not you specifically, but the Libertarian Party to do a better job than it's doing now. And not to tout we're the only ones growing. We only got 3% of the vote, but we're still growing because the Libertarian Party is still irrelevant in national politics. That's what I want to see. And if the Libertarian Party wants my help with that, if they want my advice, I will give it to them. But they've got to reach out to me. Um, and, and so, you know, I don't accept, well, if you don't like the way I'm doing, then you can come do my job for me. No, 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 no. I expect whoever's running their, the, the Libertarian Party to do a better job and, and the Libertarian Party itself to do a better job of nominating candidates that I can get behind and support. You know, and maybe you're not our target audience, Jason. I mean, this could is be. the thing. Yeah, it could be. Absolutely. The people who dismiss the party as irrelevant and useless and not a good use of their time, the vast majority of those people voted for the Republican president who's currently president right now and busy getting us into wars. You know, they Some have of them did, that. no doubt. Not they me. They have to own that. And so, you know, them going back and saying, well, I want to talk about what Bill Weld said on some interview. You know, my calendar says it's 2017. We're looking forward to the midterms. Yeah, and this is this is the issue. You know, it is... I also, you know, this is a volunteer position. I run a business. I have a family. I have three small kids. This is a tough job. 
and we're doing a good job of it. But define for me what success would be. If you ran the party, what would you consider to be success? What do you think you could do in the 2018 midterms? What would make you happy? Yeah, I think well, the first thing that I would do is 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 uh, is is try and clean up the message of what uh, of what it is that we're going to stand for, and then try and work to to put in place a figurehead for that because the. the the big problem is nobody reads platforms, so the platform is really irrelevant. Republican Party, Democrat Party, nobody really cares about that. That's something that's that's internal, uh, you know, inside baseball type stuff. What they do see are the figureheads that you put up, the Bill Welds and the Gary Johnsons, um, the local state and uh, the state and local representatives that you put into place. And you, I would want to try and create a cohesive message around that. And the second thing that I would do is I would stop as much as possible the infighting, and I would put the kibosh on guys like Arvind Vohar, who decided that he wants to attack particular par particular segments of the population and see if we can't create a um, a bigger tent for all people. That that would be my goal. And it's, it's, I, I can't give you specifics on that on the show because it would take too long. But I have thought about it on what needs to happen in order to create a uh, – to create a, a, a more – I guess a, a more uh, – useful is not the right word. A, uh, a a more valuable party, and I think those are the things that I would focus on. So, so the messaging and silencing some people. Messaging is very important. Yes, and that means if you have if if you want to go out and call military people uh, murderers, then you need to shut up or step down because that's not the messaging that we want. We're going to speak with one voice inside the party. Yeah. Okay, and and what would be success? What would success look like? There would be an increase above 5% of the vote by next, by 2020. Okay, but what would be success in 2018? I don't have any idea. Okay. I don't have any idea. I really don't, because I don't know who's running in the Libertarian Party in the different states. I don't have any, and I have a clue. Okay. Well, uh, you know, th this is the thing. I, I, I like to, I like to take criticism and try and grow from it. But it is also important that the, the critiques have to be more than, I don't like it. It has to be, what is it that we could do that would be better? Because, you know, it's kind of like there was an article today about um, the Kushner family and how they're about to lose a ton of money on their building on Fifth Avenue. You know, businessmen sometimes lie, but numbers never do. And that's the thing about working in politics as opposed to, to podcasting, although I guess it's the same thing. You have numbers, you have vote totals, you have numbers of states with ballot access, you have membership numbers, you have revenue numbers. You have ways to look at the data and see whether or not you're being successful. And, you know, to be really frank, whether or not I think that Johnson and Weld was a good ticket, whether or not I think the delegates did or didn't do the right thing, the numbers don't lie. The numbers are far and away beyond anything that they've ever done before in Libertarian Party history. And so you're arguing with success by saying it's not something I like. Okay. I, yeah, I, I, up, right? I, I, no, uh, listen. Uh, we're going to end it. We'll end it there, and I'll try and end it on a positive note because this has been a, a really. This has been probably the most abrasive interview I've ever done. And I do appreciate you coming on because I I, I told you from the beginning that I was going to be tough, and and I appreciate yeah. you you coming on and being willing to talk to me. And listen, I I'll close it this way. I really really do want. Um, a libertarian party that that is uh, that that you that that can be um, a force for good in the world. And I, I what my my criticism, my frustration comes out of a deep passion for the ideas. And so um, I hope that I really truly do hope that what uh, the successes that you have had thus far will extend into 2018 and 2020 and that you guys will just continue to knock the cover off the ball and uh, and I'll continue to try and do the same and and hopefully what we end up with is a uh, is a is a cohesive a cohesive message that will reach people and bring more people under these ideas that that we we're all so passionate about I, I hope the same thing. I thank you for having me on. I did listen to the interview. I'm used to doing hostile media. It's part of the, the job. Um, and, and I want to thank you for the work that you're doing. I appreciate the work you do. I appreciate the work that Tom does. Um, you know, one of the things that, that 
I've noticed in life is that the people who need our open advice and criticism are often our friends more than our enemies. And it's precisely because you guys are so influential in the movement and you have such an audience that I wanted to, to speak directly to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Nick. I really do appreciate you coming on the show and, uh, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Nick.